first time I ran through this, it was a little bit long, so I'm going to try and make it a little bit quicker, go through some things, and focus on the most important stuff. I did my presentation on Lori Nix and Kathleen Gerber. Typically, the credit to the work only goes to um, Lori Nix, um, but Kathleen Gerber has also had a huge role in making the models that are in these images. They've been working together since the 90s, but they're a couple in real life, which is great. Um, I think the most important points are listed out here. They have about six bodies of work and they take such a lengthy time to create that some bodies of work have images that were photographed in 2009 and at the same time they have images that were photographed in 2014. Um, so they make these miniature models and kind of the inspiration behind them comes from post-apocalyptic media that Nix grew up with um, and the, the sublime, which Nix talks about on her website, is this big concept about beauty in nature and kind of a terrifying beauty of nature that kind of heeds the end of the world, essentially. Um, and it's this style of painting that really informed the composition and color and lighting in a lot of her images. Um, and also um, her rural background in, in Kansas, plus the couple's current residence in urban Brooklyn. You'll see um, as time continues, the images kind of shift from very rural imagery to very urban imagery. Um, and here's her first series, uh, Accidentally Kansas. And I think the most notable thing about these images is that you can still see the hand. You can see that not all of these are totally realistic and not all of them, even if they were made by hand, um, look completely real. This changes over time. Things get more detailed and, and more specific, um, which definitely lends to kind of drawing in the viewer. Um, and you can see that kind of rural um, inspiration here. Uh, this is the next series called Some Other Place. Um, and again, you can kind of see the materials, you can see the hand, you can see how it was made and constructed and photographed. Um, and I think another notable thing about this is that there's the use of um, small, like, animal figures. And in these series, on occasion, there's uh, a human figure, which isn't really seen um, nearly at all in her later series. Um, so moving on, we have this image in the series Lost, which I find particularly amazing for, I mean, the color, uh, the composition, everything about it is fantastic, but I think it definitely um, is a strong image in terms of the themes that she typically works with being the ending of things, the end of the world, end of life, end of anything. Um, and I just think how you can see the city up above, there are lights in the buildings, there are people living and you know, going about their lives while just underneath the surface of the water, um, there's this shipwreck, there are these piles and piles of cars and trains and Ferris wheels and all of these things that have ended and they're piling up and up and up and they are almost reaching the surface. Um, and I think the most important thing about this image is that it really alludes to the idea that everything will end, even the city above the water will eventually crumble. Um, I just think that's incredibly powerful. I think another interesting point is to, to note the uh, the use of miniatures. She says that it's mostly out of necessity, but also makes a note that the use of miniatures kind of allows them to create this safe space to deal with such scary topics, um, which I think is a really... Uh, powerful way to look at miniatures, the use of them, especially as it's become more popular in fine arts as well as uh, general artisans and, and crafters using them for their own purposes, which is fantastic because as a miniature artist uh, myself, I find it extremely thrilling and encouraging to see other artists uh, finding so much success with it. Um, this is a series that kind of uh, diverged from their typical style. It's shot in black and white to begin with, but also it's kind of the more narrative side of things where there's this specific museum that they're creating different rooms for and different exhibits and kind of showing like the full scope of this one concept of the, uh, the, un the, the natural history museum. Um, whereas the other series, they kind of 
jump around to different locations while they focus in on one central idea, this one stays put, which is really, really interesting. Especially as you can see, these beavers are popping out of their exhibits and, you know, they're not supposed to be alive. And I think that's what makes it unnatural. They're out here and they're using a saw to cut their, their wood instead of their teeth. And they're, you know, using a saw horse. And it's, it's just very funny to see these beavers behaving like people who would normally be peering in at them. Um, and I think a, another thing to notice is how the hand starts to remove itself in these later series. Obviously, you can tell this isn't a real human. You can tell these aren't a real paintbrush, and you can tell that obviously a person shouldn't be able to paint underwater like this. Um, but I think you just start to see things become more realistic. You can see the chain off of the diver's waist and the paint tubes that are attached to it, and it's kind of floating. Everything is just becoming a little bit more considered as things continue. The little air bubbles moving upward from the diver's helmet are clearly some kind of plastic bead, but you have this consideration for okay, if this were happening in real life, what would it look like? Um, then you have this just stunning image called Spider Moth, um, which is different from the rest of the images in the series because it really focuses in. It has a similar composition to the images that you would see in Accidentally Kansas, um, but remains a, a kind of central into this natural history museum type setting, which is... Fun. And then you have the series that really get me going, really make me excited. Um, this one is called The City, and what's different about it compared to the others is that this one, as opposed to being like mainly landscape, mainly, you know, exterior spaces, apart from the previous series, which was a huge step out from what we normally saw, um, is that you're looking at these interiors, um, extremely detailed interior spaces. And this one particularly excites me because if you didn't know that you were looking at a miniature, you likely wouldn't be able to tell that that's what it is. Um, and I think that's because everything that is contained, or most everything that is contained um, within the space are things that would be made by human hands anyway as opposed to being manufactured by factories and having that kind of exact clean proportion to it. You know, you can see these materials are more like the materials that the objects themselves would be made out of in full scale. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's just exciting for me in general because, like I mentioned before, in the earlier series, there's a clear presence of their hand you can see the materials, you can see how they're being utilized and how they're being manipulated, whereas here, it's almost perfect realism. And this one is so stunning uh, and, and really funny um, in a way. It's their living room. They completely reconstructed their own living space um, and workspace, especially as you can see on the left, there is a model from one of their previous series, but it's a model of a model of a train car. So we're getting kind of inception here. Um, and the details on all the CDs on the shelf to the right and the books is just completely stunning. And this kind of alludes to the next series. It becomes more of an exterior, but this building is really crumbled and fallen apart and, um, nature has really begun to take over completely. Um, and here in Empire, this image kind of doesn't feel the same way as a lot of the others do. But I think that's because it's this exterior space that feels so natural in terms of its lighting, in terms of the plants and the trees, in terms of the snow on the ground, and again, I would not be able to tell upon first glance, if at all, without being told that this is a miniature. It looks incredibly real. 
And these are the images that kind of speak more to the style of the series Empire, like this one. And I like to think that this is um, an image relating to the city that we see above the water in that image we discussed earlier, Bounty, um, and how nature has really reclaimed it. It's this theme that she's uh, examining over and over again of the end. Um, and I just think it's, it's beautiful. Especially when you look at the construction of that arc back there. It's just, uh, it blows me away. Um, yeah, essentially, um, these two work together and they create these stunning miniatures that allude to the sublime that you would see in those paintings. Just nature completely reclaiming the earth. Um, and yet it's it's taking place in the form of these these miniature models, which is extremely modern. Um, I think that's really interesting. So here's my work cited, and I just thought I'd include an image of the artist. That's Nyx on the right. She's typically known as the architect, the ideas person, and her uh, partner Gerber on the left. And uh, she typically considers herself more the sculptor. So I don't know. I just think that's really, really cool. Um, yeah. So thank you very much. That's all.